Shut up and sit down. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Fight for Liberty show. Today, we are joined by a wonderful activist, a great liberty fighter, a liberty Jedi, if you will. Uh, he's a former Maine state senator. He is a policy advisor for Young Americans for Liberty. Mr. Eric Brakey, welcome to the show. Hey, David. Glad to be on with you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for coming. Uh, so I'm just going to start off with the, the most obvious question. Uh, what made you pull the run for office trigger? <laughs> well, I just got started. Um, you know, I just got started as a liberty activist back in 2010, uh, kind of Tea Party wave. You know, I read Ron Paul's book, The Revolution of Manifesto. I, I jumped in, did everything I could to help out. Uh, I saw in the state of Maine as, um, the um, state director for Ron Paul and his presidential campaign, um, I saw what a difference a small handful of uh, liberty-minded people uh, can make when we are organized and we have a plan and we work together to execute it. Uh, we won the state of Maine. It was one of the only states that Ron Paul won in 2012. We mm -hmm. uh, took our fight all the way to the Republican National Convention in Tampa, Florida. And after that, I just figured... You know, when Ron Paul retired from Congress and he kind of passed the torch on to all of us in the movement and asked us to run with it in our own way. Of course, Ron would never tell you what the right way to do it is. He just said, go figure it out. You'll do something. Um, I decided I was going to help other people run for the state legislature as liberty candidates. Uh, in 2012, uh, helped a few good people get reelected, uh, helped some new candidates run for the first time. And... Um, I learned a lot of lessons on state legislative races, and I thought, you know, it doesn't take a superhero to do this. Like, geez, I bet I could do this. <laughs> and I ran for state senate in 2014 against a guy who was in elected office as a Democrat for 36 consecutive years, never uh, lost a race before in his life. Uh, I was 26 at the time. And people looked at me and said, yeah, there's no way that kid's pulling it off. Nobody knows who he is. He's never run for office before. And who's going to elect this 26-year-old kid to the state Senate? But just went out there and knocked 8,000 doors, connected directly with constituents, listened to their problems, and talked with them about how we could develop solutions, not based in more government, but based in how do we get government out of the way to develop solutions based in liberty. Mm -hmm. Apparently, liberty was popular enough that I won a big landslide big surprise upset that year in 2014 uh won by about 20 points went on to uh sponsor and pass constitutional carry uh reform welfare uh get uh, right to try legislation passed the first state in new england to do so so that terminally ill patients don't have to beg for permission from the federal government to try experimental medications since then president trump has signed that into law federally uh as well as a number of other things even Helped mm -hmm. a bunch of sixth graders legalize hedgehogs as pets and uh, expanded medical cannabis policy in the state of Maine. Something I'm proud of, especially on uh, 420. Happy 420, David. Happy 420. Thank you. I uh, I have been celebrating basically all day, um, but I celebrate 420 every day. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you mentioned a lot well, of... Like I... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, it's like I, I was saying on Twitter today, you know... Uh, I know that people have a lot of opinions about, about cannabis from a moral perspective or, or even just the perspective of, is it, is it, uh, is it detrimental or beneficial for someone in their life? But you know what? I think that the Liberty movement and, and the message of Liberty accepts a broad, a broad coalition, a big tent. All okay. we have to agree is that, um, uh, even if you think that, even if someone thinks that marijuana is bad, cannabis is bad, uh, if they can just agree with us that it is more bad to kidnap people and throw them in cages for using cannabis, then I say we can be a part of the same coalition and work to make liberty win. 
Amen. Actually, one of my best friends in the Liberty Movement, uh, Mr. Reed Coverdale, is an adamant, like, straight edge person who doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, doesn't anything, uh, which is why I'm not going to invite him to my smoke sesh live stream later tonight because he's not going to be doing that. But that's fine. Like, he's still my best friend in the movement and actually in real life, too, because he's a great person. So, yeah, I 100% I agree. It, I don't need everyone, like, we don't all have to be stoners to be libertarians. Yeah, no, certainly. Uh, I think that the um, uh, many try to pigeonhole the liberty movement as, oh, you're just Republicans who care about, you know, who want to legalize marijuana. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I think that kind of misses kind of the, the whole point that, you know, the premise is, we just want to leave peaceful people alone, let people make their own decisions. You know, some of the best libertarians I know are like adamant, you know, Christians, you know, but they're Christians who understand this is supposed to, that they're, you know, the religion is supposed to be, it's the message of peace mm -hmm. and, and, you know, just let people be. And the only force we should use on people we disagree with is the force of persuasion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good Christians can be libertarians very easily, I think. Uh, if you're kind of caught up in that like forceful uh, legislate morality kind of Christianity, then then that's a whole other sect of group. But there's nothing really to back up that kind of stuff. Uh, I think. In, I think um, everyone, everyone, every group is susceptible to the temptations of the ring of power. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they see uh, other folks using it against them, and they just think, "Geez, if I could just get that ring of power." Mm -hmm good I could do in shaping the world and forcing mm -hmm. people to live the way that I think is best. But of course, uh, government force, government violence corrupts, corrupts everything, even the best of intentions. Yeah. I, I, I say it a lot on the show because we see it a lot in the liberty movement. Even we see uh, candidates running on like executive orders and like really non liberty things because they're like, well, if I was president, I could just, legalize all the drugs and prostitution on and like dissolve the federal government on day one and it's like no no you really can't like because realistically the president shouldn't have that much power that's not something the president should have that much power to do so yeah and if the president can uh, create all of these laws out of thin air on his or her own authority well that person's not going to be president forever that means that the next person can come in and they'll do something different, which is why uh, it's best when the power is decentralized and we can kind of, you know, fight for liberty from the bottom up, from the grassroots level. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Decentralization, I've, in my mind, is the key to the whole thing. You know, it's it's where we all kind of agree. Even even when you talk to most people in the on the progressive side of the left, all understand the concept of like how important community is how important localization right. of of all things are they don't like monopolies and they understand why monopolies are bad why big things are bad they hate big corporations but they understand that both that all big things are bad right and yeah. and honestly like the libertarians i think end up crossing over into that mindset too you know yeah. we understand we that just, big business is bad too we just yeah, don't talk just about it as much we just need to make sure our progressive friends come to the realization that uh, Washington D.C. is a uh, government monopoly, <laughs> and right. it is uh, uh, it is it is the worst kind of monopoly because uh, this one can actually uh, you know use violence against you. Yeah, a monopoly on violence is a lot worse than a monopoly on like shoes or something. <laughs> it certainly is when it's abused. Right. Uh, I've actually had a, quite a few conversations with newer people to the movement lately about that, uh, the, the monopoly on violence, like that phrasing exactly. Because uh, I've had a few people tell me that the government should have a monopoly on violence because because uh, otherwise other people would be being violent, basically. Uh, <laughs> was was kind of their mindset uh and it was a difficult thing to explain why or the difference between a monopoly on violence because they don't have that everyone can be violent but they have a monopoly on legal violence or or allowed violence and it's that's mm -hmm. a, a little bit more 
difficult of a phrasing to really explain to people. I actually had to struggle through that uh, in the last couple of weeks. Um. <clears throat> yeah, you know, it's it's actually. So it's a very kind of Randian idea, or at least I I, um, I remember Ayn Rand talking a lot about, you know, because she was certainly no um, anarcho-capitalist. She was, maybe you call her a minarchist. You know, she wouldn't use that label. She just, she's just an objectivist, if you ask her. But, uh, but, but she talks about, you know, the kind of the perfect world where the state has the monopoly on violence. But of course, in her perfect world, you know, that monopoly on violence is, 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 used purely defensively uh, to protect people's kind of individual rights uh, and, and freedoms. And of course, I think that's similar to how the founding generation view, you know, what the proper role of government was. But the problem is when you kind of create a monopoly of, uh, of, of, of violence, what can oppose it from abusing that monopolistic power? It's the same reason we kind of fear uh, monopolies in the corporate sense, uh, because when there's no kind of competition, when there's no kind of opposing force, there the, the the temptation to abuse uh, the power that's inherent in that uh, in that monopoly is uh, uh, it will it will necessarily come to be abused. So mm. I mean I think this is why kind of the you know to the point of decentralization, this is why it's so important is because you know the founders understood you know if we can have uh, you know checks and balances across you know you know, horizontally across the three branches of governments, that, that, that's great. But also if we can have checks and balances across, you know, local level, state level, uh, and the federal level, all kind of competing for power. What we've really lost, I think, so much in our society is, uh, is that, that sense of that the states or the localities have any right to challenge, you know, the edicts of Washington, D.C. And, um, but I think we start to see glimmers of hope, whether it's, uh, marijuana, uh, you know, nullification of, of federal cannabis laws or mm -hmm. nullification of federal gun laws, which is going mm -hmm. on right now. Uh, there are there, you know, there's some bright sh shining uh, issues where decentralization is winning. Yeah, those are the two best examples of because because it is exactly what you just said it's a nullification of federal law it's not they're not necessarily legalizing it you know it's a little or you know they are but they also have to do their statewide nullification and that's a fun thing to understand that they're being like yeah the country i'm in says this is illegal but i don't care and i have the right to say i don't care because my whole state said that they don't care and so right we don't care. <laughs> well, and 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 all the better when the Constitution is on your side. You know this document that they all swear an oath to uphold, uh, but they uh, promptly ignore. I mean, you know, where in Article One, Section Eight was the? F I mean, if let's we can talk about cannabis since it's four twenty day. Like, where in Article One, Section Eight did we give Congress the authority to declare the legal status of a plant? It's not in there. You won't find it. You know, at, at least when uh, alcohol was prohibited, there was a common understanding that you had to amend the Constitution to do that because, you know, 10th Amendment says all power is not granted to Congress or reserved to the states and the people. Mm -hmm. So we never gave them the authority to prohibit alcohol. They passed a constitutional amendment to do it and then realized how stupid that was and amended the Constitution again to repeal that. But mm -hmm. they never, they never, uh, they never even attempted that for cannabis. They just ignored the Constitution. Uh, they actually, uh, I was reading uh, in Ron Paul's The Revolution, he actually talks about this very well, about the, um, uh, you know, the history of how cannabis came to be illegal on the federal level, which was, uh, uh, obviously there was a lot of racism against, against Mexicans, um, but the public testimony on this was, a total of in committee was a total of two hours. There were exactly two medical experts, one for, one against. Uh, the one who was against it was from the American Medical Association saying, we have no evidence whatsoever to back up these claims that cannabis is so harmful to people. Um, 
But when it came to the floor, uh, the floor vote, there was a total of one minute and 30 seconds debate. People didn't know what marijuana was. They were calling it marijuana instead of cannabis, which people did know what that was mm. because of many medical purposes. It was a total of a minute and 30 seconds of debate, which included a uh, congressman asking the speaker, uh, what is this? Is this some kind of narcotic? How does the American Medical Association feel about this? And the speaker says, oh, the American Medical Asso Association supports this bill a hundred percent, even though they had testified against it. And then it passed into law. And that's how marijuana became to be federally illegal. Well, folks, there you have it. That is your government at work for you. Your tax dollars paid for that process. Congratulations. <laughs> that's ridiculous. That's the, the, there's so many different parts of that story piss me off it's uh it's extremely so so you actually yeah. sat in a, in a state house I, I wish i i wish i could t yeah um yeah so you actually sat sat in a state house you like held the power for for a little bit in some in some sense of the word um how how did that feel being a, a small government like kind of anti-government person being government like being a virus in the system. Um, you know, I, I remember I remember one day turning to my Democrat co-chairman. I was the Senate chairman for the Health and Human Services Committee. I remember turning to her one day and just saying, do you ever stop and realize that we're the mafia? And she said, what are you talking about? We're not the mafia. <laughs> uh, but of course, when you kind of boil it down and you remove all the kind of um, the pomp and circumstance and, and just kind of the, the religiosity of government, you realize that functionally, I mean, this is this is an organized crime organization. We, we use violence to kind of get what we want, tell people how to live their lives, steal their money, uh, go, you know, bomb other countries, take their stuff. I mean, this is, uh, uh, this is the structure of government. I mean, as it has become, as we've drifted away from the constitutional limits that our government was conceived under. Mm -hmm. So I, this is something that I tried to fight back every day against. And some days I was more successful than others. Uh, when I will say that my greatest successes in the legislature came not from kind of the traditional route of trying to influence policy that most politicians will tell you that is the way things is done. Most politicians will say the way you do it is, you know, you uh, you make friends, you build relationships with your fellow legislators, uh, you have you know good debate and discourse on the ideas, and you know you you know it's but it's the relationships that matter so much. In fact, um, I ran in the opposite direction. Uh, by the time I was done in my two terms in the state senate, a lot of my colleagues hated me. Um, and yet, in a time of divided government, you know, Democrats controlled the House, Republicans controlled the Senate. I was one of the more accomplished legislators in the entire, you know, in the entire uh, body, uh, you know, as far as passing major legislation. I mean, to this day, we're the only state that ever passed constitutional carry through a Democrat-controlled chamber, um, and it was because not because that is impressive. I, yeah, you know, and you know. Texas right now is debating, can we get this through our Republican-controlled Senate? It's like, we got it through our Democrat-controlled House of Representatives. I don't know what's wrong with you guys, Texas. <laughs> but we don't have time for that Texas. list. <laughs> they did pass constitutional carry through the House just the other day, which was, which was awesome. So uh, we got some more work to do there. But, um, but the key to my success was not building relationships with the politicians, but building relationships with the constituents of the politicians, because you can get a politician to do what you want them to do when you make them afraid for their reelections, because in the back of their mind, every politician is worried about their reelection. Mm -hmm. And when they are getting their email inbox flooded, their uh, voicemail, their phone is ringing off the hook of constituents who want constitutional carry and are ready to vote against them if they don't support constitutional carry, 
whatever the personal feelings of that state legislator are, they think long and hard about that vote. Mm. And I remember a particular Republican state senator who, when it came time to vote on constitutional carry in Maine, she said, I don't think the people of Maine want constitutional carry, but for some reason, the people of my district really do want constitutional carry. And she voted for it. I don't know what her personal feelings were one way or the other on the issue. I tend to think that she didn't go into the legislature thinking that uh, she did support it, but uh, for self-preservation, she voted for it. And that's the power that, that the people have when we are organized uh, and we effectively put pressure on our elected officials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and having that direct line to them and having that more engaged populace uh, is, is very crucial to that. Uh, I had uh, Naomi Matthew on the show uh, a She's week great. and a half ago. She is. Uh, she told the story of you in uh, in the, uh, I think it was the state house in Texas, uh, getting asked how big a state Senate district was in Maine. <laughs> uh, and uh, when it, when you have that, district size a manageable district where you can actually talk to every single person in the district you're able to to have that interaction where you know in new yeah. york uh i don't I'm, i've met i've met my state i've met my senator like my i've actually met chuck schumer but i have not met my state senator ever yeah it's it's kind of crazy. So in Maine, my state Senate district was about roughly, you could say, you know, just to round it off, about 50,000 people. Um, now, in, when you break it down in terms of who the voters are, you're looking at maybe about 20,000 people, maybe a little less who, who, who vote. Um, 10,000 votes will win you the election. Um, so it was possible for me and I went out and I knocked on every single door that I could and I targeted, you know, I was smart and kind of who I, you know, targeting people who are going to be likely voters. Um, but it's possible to really, you know, in these, in these smaller districts to really get to know your constituents, mm -hmm. to have a personal relationship with them, to have the point where they feel comfortable voting for you because they feel like they know you and they feel like they can get a hold of you if they need your help. Because now, while certainly part of, you know, serving in the legislature is working on the issues and fighting for policy. I mean, that's, you know, one of my biggest things that I love to do, but also part of it is helping your constituents navigate this incredibly bureaucratic apparatus of the state. If they need, uh, you know, if their social security check isn't coming in or, you know, you know, there, there's all these kind of these, these, these moments when people need to interact with the state and it's, and it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's certainly not not efficient like the free market is. Um, so you don't say. But the crazy thing is when you think about <laughs> the, the crazy thing is um, not that the districts in Maine are so small. The crazy thing is how many of the districts across the country, including our congressional districts, are so big. I mean, the 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 size of my state Senate district in terms of population is about the size that the founding generation envisioned a congressional district being in terms of population. Um, that's crazy to think about today because we think of congressmen as representing, you know, like, you know, a million people. Um, and it's just, um, you know, how do you have a representative system when you represent a million people? You can't. It, it's literally impossible, I believe, to to really ever be in touch or in tune with that amount of people, and especially not when it's a popularity contest. And the fact that we just have a two-tiered popularity contest uh, with the House and the Senate makes even less sense. Uh, there, the uh, having a general election of senators, I think, was the, one of the worst decisions we made like as a country after after the bill of like after we founded like we, we made a couple of other pretty bad ones but i i think that's pretty high up there on just like the most fundamental mess up that we've had i don't know if you, how, how strongly you feel about the the way we elect our senators yeah you know it's it, 
Yeah, I see pros and cons in both. I, you know, I, I do think that, well, I certainly, I, I like the idea of the Senate being more clearly, you know, representing the states. I mean, that's what the Senate was kind of created for, to represent the states as sovereign bodies, whereas the House was supposed to represent the people. Um, you know, as I understand it, I think there was, you know, there was some degree of people basically bribing their way, buying up the politicians to vote for them, uh, uh, for, 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 um, for, for us Senator. So I, I, you know, I think both, both systems have their problems. Um, but I do think that ultimately whatever system we have, I think sometimes we can, uh, we, we run the risk of kind of getting caught up a little bit in, you know, if we have this one thing, it's going to fix everything. It's going to, we're going to have the silver bullet term limits, you know, term limits is one of those things that, uh, you know, I'm for term limits. I think term limits can be helpful, but mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to be the silver bullet that puts down the werewolf. You know, what right. we ultimately need is we need, uh, we need a public that demands liberty. And, uh, and sadly right now we have a public that is, uh, too easily controlled by fear and hands over our freedoms too easily to those promising us a false sense of security. That's I, I like the way that you put that. We need a public that demands liberty, because at the moment we don't, at all. We're just like, oh, you're gonna give us a little bit today. Thank you, thanks. I I appreciate that that liberty. Uh, I actually, yeah. I, so I went to uh, Barnes and Noble the other day. I was looking, I was looking for some like old school economy books because i'm actually pretty unread when it comes to the typical libertarian reading lists like the rothbard and the mises and the hayek and the spooner and like i haven't really read much of anything fun fact barnes noble doesn't sell anything libertarian at all like it's it's awful like i couldn't find anything that was like even all the business books were like pretty not good on the on the free market side of things but I did find this, and it's the U.S. Constitution and other key writings. So it's got the everything from the Mayflower Compact to uh, Obama's address on the death of bin Laden. Just like every or almost every famous speech. And so I, I'm not very far in. This was only a couple days ago. So the second thing in there is uh, give me liberty or give me death. <laughs> which I had never actually, I think maybe I read it in like in middle school or something like that, but I haven't read it through in a while. And it's so perfect for right now. Cause he's straight up saying like everybody else or cause, cause he's speaking after uh, the people speak to say, don't go, let's not send the military to war. So he's giving a rebuttal. So he's like, these guys will tell you to just sit down, wait it out. It'll be fine. But it's not like, this is, this is the time to go. And it's just like, it's such a powerful message. And I think it resonates kind of right now, you know, after we just had the most ridiculous year uh, of just destroying all of our fundamental rights as humans for an entire calendar year now. Uh, it's, it's, we've, we're way past the line of whether or not we can, uh, just just beg for our freedoms a little bit more each day uh as as we're you know within this same corrupt system we, like we need to attack it from all angles like you're talking about yeah there's no one silver bullet it's not it's not just like we're not just gonna elect justin amash in 2024 either you know we're not just gonna there's not just like he, one magic yeah thing. and even if we did even if we you know yeah, if Ron Paul like uh, found the fountain of youth and got twenty years younger and ran for president, and we got him elected uh, to the White House, um, you know that wouldn't fix everything. And Ron talked about this at the time time too. It's like, you know, just getting the president elected. Uh, you know, we we like to think that that person can, you know, just wave a wand and fix everything, but. Uh, if the political infrastructure underneath them is opposed to everything that they are attempting to do, they're not going to have a lot of success. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like him or don't like him, I, I have very mixed feelings on him, but you know, Donald Trump, we can look at him. I mean, it wasn't just the elected political apparatus that was against him. It was the unelected. 
it was the the CIA, the FBI, the you know, we call it the deep state or whatever we want to call it. They they mobilized to undermine. I mean, they framed this guy for treason for three years. They dragged uh, it out. They they dragged fake stories through the corporate press. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Russian collusion, which only they revealed that there was no basis for after the midterm elections when Democrats when they put Democrats in in charge of the House to start you know impeachment trials against him. I'm not saying that you have to like Trump. To, to to see kind of uh, you don't have to like Trump to see the mechanism of what happened there and if they could do that to a Trump they would certainly do that to a Ron Paul or a Justin Amash or Thomas Massey whoever we got elected to uh, you know to the White House unless we can build the ground up political you know structure in this country underneath them mm -hmm. I think the way to do that is going after the state legislatures I think that's the best place to place our efforts right now. That's why I'm working with Young Americans for Liberty uh, to elect liberty-minded people to state capitals across the country. We've got 170, actually, we just kicked out three people today. So 176 people in our, our Liberty Legislator Coalition. We have high standards in our Liberty Legislator Coalition and we kick people out if they uh, do Good. things like promising to support constitutional carry and then not following through. Um, so you know, some folks in South Carolina, <laughs> but um, uh, but we have high standards and we're not and we expect to maintain those because we want to elect and support champions, uh, not people who talk a good game and then mm -hmm. uh, just end up falling in with the uh, establishment. But um, but I think that by building this kind of political infrastructure, state by state, you know, in the state capitals, uh, we're starting to see some interesting things happen. In New Hampshire, for example, is uh, the Liberty Republicans are now the majority of the majority in the House of Representatives. Uh, and they're, you know, on the road to passing right to work and school choice. They're, they're the first state in New England to end the mask mandates. Um, some good things happening there. And I think that that is, uh, those are seeds that have been planted and been growing for a, a long time. I remember when the Free State Project was just starting 10 years ago. <laughs> and uh, we're starting to see some of these things come to fruition, but it's still uh, there's still a lot of growth to happen. And New Hampshire could be a model for, you know, how this can work in states across the country. Yeah, for sure. Do you think that the goal would be uh, to run these people into state legislatures and then into Congress and move them up or, you know, kind of leapfrog people over them? Or would it be more to control states and pass legislation similar to like what Kentucky just did that nullifies like whatever federal law their state deems unconstitutional and just start to like not secede, you know, we're not talking necessarily that, but like just start to just nullify the federal laws at a state level. Oh, oh I lost you, your audio too. And, all right, yep, I can there. hear you now. Sorry about that. There you go. No worries. Uh, yeah, technology. I don't know what's going on. It must be the NSA messing with us. Um, Wouldn't be surprised. But I, I think I, I got the gist of your question. Um, so I would say, obviously, I think it's a benefit. You know, if we elect people to the state legislatures today, you look at at Congress and over 50% of all the currently sitting members of Congress served in their state legislatures beforehand. So it's obvious that serving in the state legislature can become a pathway to going to the federal level um, for US Senate, for Congress. I made the attempt, you know, I've, I ran for US Senate and for US Congress. Um, so obviously I think there's value in that. Uh, and some of our members are doing that. So like you've got Anthony Sabatini, who is a great legislator, a liberty legislator in Florida, who recently announced that he's running for Congress. He's someone to watch who's got a really good shot of winning there. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I think it would be a mistake to get too fixated on Washington, D.C. And for people to think that if you, if all you do is go to your state capital, that, you know, 
that you, you've, you're only like in the junior leagues and you haven't made it to the major leagues and who cares about the junior leagues? No, I'm saying that the state capitals are where the apparatus of tyranny is the most vulnerable. And that's where we should be concentrating our, our resources there, not just to get people elected to Congress. That's a nice benefit. But if we get people elected to the state capitals, we can start doing more nullification efforts. We can fight back. So not just against state level tyranny, but we can fight against federal tyranny from the state level, like mm -hmm. the, the model has been shown with nullification of cannabis laws, with nullification of, of gun laws, like some states are doing right now. We can, uh, we're doing big efforts to, uh, uh, right now in 31 states are considering legislation, defend the guard legislation to uh, basically say, you don't, Washington DC doesn't get to deploy our men and women in uniform in the National Guard into foreign wars if they don't follow the Constitution and mm -hmm. actually declare war. So uh, there's a lot we can do on the state level to fight back against tyranny. And I think that that is of immense value in its own right, not just as a means to get people into Congress. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that one up because that's one that I, I kind of forget about. And when... I don't know what's going on, but I've lost audio again. Oh. Hold on. It's the Democrats, guys. They're hating. Here. Testing. Maybe. Question well, mark. all right. I'm hearing you through my uh, my computer speaker now. I don't know what's going on. Um, as long as you're not getting feedback from the microphone, I suppose we can continue this way. So far, so good. Uh, all right. Yep. Yeah, I'm not. Get, I'm not hearing any echo. So. Well, great. <laughs> we'll just keep. All we'll right. just. Hey, if it's working, I won't mess with it. It's the Democrats. I swear. Uh, I, I have. I have a very close friend uh, named Emmanuel who. I also has a podcast and any literally any time there's any technical difficulties, not just on the podcast in real life, like this is him all day, you know, I'll hang out with him. His phone doesn't work. Democrats be hating be like every time <laughs> swear every single time. It's just, it's the Democrats there. It's, it's Cuomo. He's, he's doing some shit. Like, <laughs> well, when, when I, when I blame, when I, I, when I joke, you know, Oh, it's the, the NSA, I'm only half joking. <laughs> I figure uh, I figure if I haven't ended up on their watch list yet, I haven't been doing my job right. And I right. think I've, uh, uh, the national security state spent a bunch of money to keep me out of Congress this go around. So obviously I'm on their radar in, in some capacity. But uh, um, anyway, I'm half joking. I don't think they're messing with the microphone here. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's, uh, it's not out of the realm of possibility, but it's, it's out of the realm of likelihood. Let's say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think, uh, I don't think they're messing with my Bluetooth. I think that's just, uh, that's just Apple. Yeah. Just the failure of technology. I have had a couple of very weird instances on live streams, especially on Instagram specifically where uh, I'll be like really getting into the meat of a conversation with someone or on, like really on a good rant. And then I'll just like lose data on my cell phone or something like that. Just like, it'll just cut randomly. And it, it's happened probably four or five times now. It's, it's too much to just ignore, honestly. It's really weird how often that happens. I'm like, this is should, I don't know. I, I wouldn't put it past Mark Zuckerberg to have some sort of like <laughs> filter to like hear what you're saying and then start screwing with you. Like, you know, on the one hand, I, you know, it, it, it's easy to dismiss those things and say, oh, yeah, that's crazy. But on the other hand, after everything we've been through this last year, crazier things have <laughs> turned out to be true. So who knows? Right. I love that we live in the timeline that Alex Jones is right like 17 times over in <laughs> three years. You know, I, I had a Twitter Twitter poll for what it's worth. I, it's a self-selecting audience, certainly. But I asked, you know, who is uh, uh, who's more factually accurate, Alex Jones or CNN? And it was just overwhelmingly Alex Jones. Now, I think that that's true, not because I'm a fan of Alex Jones, but because I'm really not a fan of CNN. <laughs> yes. Like, 
uh, it certainly uh, when 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 we're in a when we're in a world where uh, PizzaGate turned out to have more uh, facts behind it than RussiaGate, uh, we're in a we're in a strange uh, strange timeline. Mm. PizzaGate is an interesting one. Uh, I'm not sure if, if you caught there was a an FBI memo that went out back in 2019, like March or May of 2019, uh, talking about uh, domestic terrorism and like the newest, and it listed like conspiracy theorists as the newest, as like a new uh, kind of domestic terrorist, like so that like putting that, like adding them to the list of like all of the, re like all of the things that they associate with domestic terrorism. And they specifically cited QAnon and Pizzagate as like thing like uh, clues that these people might be domestic terrorists, and it was really sketchy because this came out two months before uh, the like real big federal conversation on red flag laws was happening, where when like Trump and Crenshaw were both like super loud about being pro red flag laws, and like it was it really looked like it was going to get passed federal yeah. or Republican control or controlled Senate, like, uh, that was, that had almost just come out. So when you combine the two together, you're talking about like the people that are saying, Hmm, maybe there's a pedophilia ring within our elites are now legally able to get their guns taken from them. Right. And like, and we never like really got answers about, uh, you know, Epstein, <laughs> you know, it's like this whole big story. It's kind of been, you know, swept under the rug and we don't talk about it anymore, but it's like, all right. So it turns out there was, there are, you know, there it was at least one big pedophile ring that seemed to implicate a lot of elite people in society. And mm -hmm. um, conveniently he killed himself. And um, well, I guess we can all forget about that now and go back to our lives. I mean, it. look, I, you know, it's funny how conspiracy has become this kind of dirty word or this kind of like, mm -hmm. we know that some conspiracies are real. I know I've been a part of some conspiracies. I, I'm part of a libertarian conspiracy to take over the world and leave everyone alone. <laughs> you know, I, right. you know, but it's like, what, what is a conspiracy? A conspiracy is when two or more people get together uh, to plan something. Uh, and a dangerous conspiracy is when I'm not invited to it. So uh, that's all a conspiracy is, and 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 uh, certainly there are a lot of like crazy things out there. Mm -hmm. You know, people have conspiracy theories about aliens and all that. But then the military comes out and says, "Yeah, actually, we do have footage of UFOs." So I don't even know what to believe right. in. <laughs> all right. the conspiracy right. theories I thought were crazy, uh, some of them are. You know, again, you know. again, we live in the timeline where Alex <laughs> Jones is right. A lot, like too often. <laughs> it's oh my gosh! I was actually I was on uh, another show with uh, with Reed Coverdale and uh, uh, Eric Jackman last night, mm -hmm. and uh, Jackman does does a pretty good uh, does a pretty good Trump impression, and you know was just going off about the aliens and Netanyahu, and it was fucking it was prime. It was just great. You know, <laughs> I think the the. The important lesson in all of this is, and I think that libertarians kind of um, kind of get this better than a lot of folks in society, because it's kind of the foundation of our, our whole philosophy is we have to be humble enough to recognize that there is a lot we don't know. Mm -hmm. And um, anyone who thinks that they have the absolute total truth or the answers for you, how to live your life, this is a person who... Um, uh, this is, you know, um, I think it says in, in Proverbs that the truly, the truly, the truly wise person understands, you know, is the person who just knows how much they don't know. Um, this is the problem with central planning, of course, people who think they know everything, but they don't know your life. They don't know how you want to live. Um, and so look, there are plenty of like crazy things people come up with crazy conspiracy theories. And some of them I can rule off kind of right off the bat, but like, but also, just, I don't know, keep an open mind. This has been a crazy year. A lot of things that we were told weren't true turned out to be kind of true. 
So mm -hmm. uh, I, I accept there's a lot of things going on in the world I don't know, and I'm just going to keep pushing for liberty. Amen. Amen. So when are you joining the Libertarian Party? Uh, you know, when is the Libertarian Party going to be able to win under a two-party system? Uh, well, I mean, we did last year quite a bit. Oh, yeah. We've done a couple this year. Well, I know uh, that. Well, not state ledge, but. Well, he did win one to the state legislature in Wyoming, uh, Marshall Burt. And Young yep. Americans for Liberty helped with that race, and, and he's doing a great job. We're glad to have Marshall there. He's the first person to win state legislative race in a quarter of a century, I believe, maybe even longer, uh, as a Libertarian Party candidate. Um, but also in his race, one of the two major parties didn't have a candidate. So it was a, it was a head to head. I think yeah, that's, yeah. that's, I think, look, I, and I've obviously I've had debates with people, Dave Smith and folks about this. And, um, I have tremendous respect for anyone who's kind of getting out behind the computer screen and going out and doing something proactive to promote Liberty. Uh, I just, you know, when I look at the Libertarian Party, it seems like trying to fit a, a square peg into a round hole. Uh, just because of the way that the rules of the system are written, they were written by the two major parties to effectively um, make third parties, make it, if not impossible, incredibly rare for a third party to have any success. Mm -hmm. Probably the only path for the Libertarian Party to succeed under a two-party model is if one of the two major parties completely collapses and is replaced. Now, there are efforts across the country to change voting laws, pass things like ranked choice voting or approval voting or things like that. Maybe mm -hmm. if those kind of you know spread across the country, maybe there would be a path of viability. But uh, in this kind of first past the post plurality based system where most of the elections are decided are in the primaries. And, uh, and I think that we can, uh, you know, we can win in these primaries, at least certainly for state legislative races. Um, and I, I have to say, I've been wondering more and more, I mean, how much kind of uh, the buildup of the libertarian party has had a detrimental effect on both of the two major parties. Um, obviously I, as a, as a right libertarian, I want to encourage as many right libertarians to join me in the Republican Party and help take over the GOP and make it a liberty party. But I also can't help but notice that a lot of left libertarians have joined the LP over the course of the last you know decade or so. Mm -hmm. And I can't help but notice that the Democrat Party is looking more authoritarian than ever. And I wonder if because a lot of those more left-leaning civil libertarians, um, you know, I, what I used to call like the ACLU type libertarian, uh, the ACLU type Democrats mm -hmm. aren't really Democrats anymore. And, you know, they've been leaving. I, I wonder if we are on both sides, on both the left and the right of the liberty movement, we are essentially um, setting up both of the major parties that are going to rule over us to be as authoritarian as possible because we aren't voices in there agitating for liberty. Yeah, I can definitely see there. There's a, a trend in in both of the major parties to be to be significantly more authoritarian since uh, since or, yeah for for like you said about the last decade, probably two at this point. Ever since we went to a war and started just you know spending billions of dollars a year on just unconstitutional bs and then trying to justify it uh it's been it's been pretty bad i i don't know that it's because our we're not in there speaking because i think i mean we still have a lot of the same people at least within the parties uh, you know we've lost a few of the voices over the last few years um unfortunately justin and tulsi within the last year that was that was rough i think to to the hopes of congress i do like pete mayer though he looks like a good replacement uh i i think that what i'm noticing is that even though the government is getting more authoritarian uh the populace is getting more libertarian and i think the government getting more authoritarian is just a trend line of any government that's ever existed over the history of humanity and you know no no government has really just like reigned in itself just been like you know what we're not doing this quite right we should we should give some more freedoms back to the people like right 
Right. It, the freedom will only come back to the people when the people demand it and make, you know, it's uh, as Thomas Jefferson said, when the uh, when the people fear the government, there's tyranny. But when the government fears the people, there's liberty. Only when the people demand it and make the government afraid of the consequences of keeping our, our liberties from us will we find our liberties restored. Mm -hmm. uh, if people are willing to sit complacent and let these things disappear, they will. But of course, that also, uh, you know, centralized government is unsustainable. And we can only go down this road so far before it ends. Mm -hmm. uh, we can, you know, we can choose to proactively, uh, you know, make the decisions now ahead of time to, you know, be have responsible, fiscally responsible government and, and restore the constitution and kind of move things back, you know, intentionally, or we'll have our liberties restored in the same way they were for the people of the Soviet Union, because the empire will collapse. Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, there is also the, the way that they were restored or, or given, or I, I, ooh, ooh, I'm not going to say those words, uh, uh, <laughs> written down the first time in 1776. But I, I, I hope that that's not the way that it goes. I will say that loud and clear for anyone watching that thinks I'm a terrorist. I don't want there to be a civil war. It's kind of funny that, you know, you're just, um, you know, saying how great the founding fathers were and how they did things. And you have to put an asterisk on that and say, by the way, I'm not a terrorist. <laughs> it's kind right. of crazy. We're at a point where it's like to celebrate the founding fathers uh, is uh, uh, could be considered celebrating terrorism. Mm -hmm. In the purest of senses at this point. I mean, certainly and, the British considered them terrorists. Yeah. And let's be real. The founding fathers wouldn't would have been dropping bodies by now. Oh yeah, the yeah, the, the, a long time ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Back in like the 1800s. Like <laughs> they would have shot up Lincoln like before Wilkes Booth got to him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, was, someone did. Um but it's it's certainly um Yeah, I I I I often think, you know, if if the founding generation now i will say we often talk about the founding generation like they were kind of a monolithic like they all agreed on everything and had the same mind on things i mean obviously that wasn't true just in the factionalism you had between like alexander hamilton's faction and thomas jefferson's faction but um you well, know they were libertarians of course they didn't agree on anything <laughs> well, i wouldn't even i wouldn't i wouldn't classify hamilton as a libertarian but I don't know. Maybe Michael Malice would disagree with me. He loves he loves Hamilton. Does but, he? Um, oh to, yeah, he had Tom Woods had a whole that. debate on Hamilton versus Jefferson. You should go back and watch it. Oh, I will enjoy that. That was a few years back. I won't tell you who won. It was a like it was a Oxford style or Cambridge style. I don't know. One of those people vote. Yeah, yeah. Where where do they think going into the debate? What do they think going out of the debate? And you know, anyway. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is, but really, even when you boil down that conflict between Jefferson and Hamilton, it really boils down to what we were talking about before. It is the clash between people who believe in centralized power versus those who believe in decentralized power. And that's the fight we're still fighting today. And so those of us who believe in the decentralization of government power, we are the intellectual descendants of Thomas Jefferson. And those who believe in concentrating ever more power in the hands of an elite few in Washington, D.C., they are the intellectual descendants of Alexander Hamilton. Um, yeah. So we're just still fighting the same war for 10 generations now. Mm -hmm. uh, arguably, Hamilton was better than most of his quote-unquote intellectual descendants right now. Certainly, I'd I would say. take Alexander Hamilton over any of them. <laughs> but given a long enough timeline, I imagine Alexander Hamilton would have ended up in much the same place. That's true. He did kind of die young, <laughs> first of all. And secondly, uh, but yeah, he, so I actually defended him a little bit on uh, a, another podcast the other day because we were discussing just like how people, uh, how ignorance kind of is an excuse sometimes. And when you think about the founding, like monarchy was the only, or, you know, democracy was, was a thing, but 
only with um, still a monarchy above it. Like the idea of an elected president, the way that we do it was a brand new idea. So we criticize him a lot for like wanting to return to the monarchy, but that was like the best thing that existed at the time. And I feel like we're going to have the same critiques thrown at the libertarian party in like 300 years. It's like these idiots just wanted to go back to the constitution. The constitution was terrible. Like we have such a better thing now. This motherfucker wanted to go back to the constitution. Yeah, they wanted to have a government. Psh, right. They're so passe. They're those oppressive institutions that people had back in the 21st century. Right. Before we all became enlightened and uh, got rid of those mafia like organizations. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, who knows? Who knows what the future might hold? And and certainly, I it is uh, it is worthwhile always, I think, to have a little bit of humility as we look back in those in history, and we don't judge them too harshly because we have, you know, we have the benefit of history <laughs> to learn from, and they 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 didn't have that same history, at least uh, th th that part of the history that wasn't written yet for them, so. Mm -hmm. I know like Thomas Jefferson gets it really hard. People, uh, people judge him for, you know, he's a slave owner. Um, and, uh, certainly, um, certainly, uh, you know, in certain ways, a hypocrite, um, you know, this is the man who kind of, you know, penned in the declaration of independence that we all have unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And yet while he himself, um, on many occasions tried to find a pathway to abolish slavery. You know, his first term in the Virginia House of Delegates, he sponsored legislation to create a pathway towards ab abolition. It didn't mm -hmm. go over very well for him. No. Um, uh, he, he, he said at that time, or he wrote that, I, I, I learned that the people, that the state of Virginia is not ready to abolish slavery. Um, but throughout his life, he, he, certainly, he certainly tried to find opportunities to you know, to bring about the end of slavery. Uh, but at the end of his life, you know, unlike George Washington, he didn't make any provision to free his slaves. Um, in fact, he had so many debts to pay uh, from his, you know, he was a bit of a, while he was a fiscal conservative in terms of government, he was a bit of a spendthrift in terms of his personal life uh, for books and fine wines. And he had debts at the end of his life that caused all of the the slaves he owned to be basically get the worst fate imagined for a slave, which was to be separated from their family and, and just sold off, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, Jefferson's an enigma, but I have always uh, thought if you aren't a mockery of your own ideals, uh, you haven't set your ideals high enough. And uh, I think that those who look back in history and judge Jefferson, you know, for uh, failing to live up to those ideals, well, it's only because he gave us those ideals by which to judge him. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if if uh, if he hadn't given America its mission statement, uh, perhaps uh, we, we we wouldn't we wouldn't uh, have that intellectual framework to look back and 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 judge him so harshly. Yeah, I'd also argue he's he's arguably the best vice president we've ever had. I don't uh, know about the best president. <laughs> Well, I mean, he. Why, why would you say? I know uh, he was vice president under under Adams, and they didn't get along. Um, so well, he was vice president. He actually penned the rules of the Senate as he was, you know, because being president of ah. the Senate, he ended up being the person because Adams didn't do shit as vice president. So vice president really wasn't a thing when Jefferson became vice president. So he basically president of the Senate and created the rules for the Senate that every bill had to be read out loud twice before it was voted on. And like all of these like long rules, which uh, actually Rand Paul cites a lot of those original rules in his uh, read the read the laws. Read the Act bills. Act. Read, read the <laughs> yeah. bills. Act. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, so it's yeah. Yeah. I, he, he did that's stuff. That's, that you know that, that's that's fascinating. I'd never thought about that aspect of uh, of, of of Jefferson's legacy. I mean, he, he really was. I mean, you know, when I look at everything he did in his life, I just feel lazy. <laughs> I mean, he, he basically created the you know uh, modern educational system as we know it. Uh, he um, you know 
you know, help draft the first um, written, you know, um, uh, the first written constitution uh, in Virginia. Uh, he, he, um, you know, he has so many accomplishments in his life that being president of the United States, uh, like, doesn't even seem that impressive, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, when when measured up against it. In fact, I don't. I, I think that that was kind of like an asterisk on his tombstone. Um, yeah, unfortunately, he participated in that bullshit. Like, <laughs> like he fought the state with all of his might, except for the eight years in which he was the head of it and was a tyrant, and then. Well, he, he was all right in his first term. Um, he lost his way a little bit, I think, in the second term with the tariffs and the trade war. And it was kind of, he kept doubling down on that rather than realizing what a disaster it was. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it just kind of goes to show that, like, I, I, I've often thought how relieved Jefferson must have been when he got to take off that ring of power and be done with it and go back home. And you got to think if even Thomas Jefferson couldn't handle that ring of power, how do we expect any human being to uh, to to um, not become corrupted by uh, this uh, by this institution of the presidency the moment mm -hmm. that they're put into it? Mm -hmm. Do you think you'd get corrupted? Um, I think it's possible. I think I've always thought, you know, the reason the 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 edge that I had in not becoming kind of uh, corrupted by the ring of power, so to speak, it, it, while serving in office was having the full uh, knowledge and humility to accept that I could. You know, I'm I'm a human being. Uh, I, um, I I think that. Um, you know, serving in political office, there should be institutions of accountability built around me, just the same as as any other human. I mean, we're all we're all humans. We there we all have inherent human nature, and we certainly I think everyone goes in. I think for the most part, people run for office going with with good intentions, wanting to do good for their fellow man, uh, but uh, oftentimes getting there without a clear sense of political principle allows them to be kind of led astray. Uh, and it, it's, um, it, there's a lot of forces, there's a lot of forces working against you kind of standing up for, for the principles of liberty when mm -hmm. you're in an institution of power. Um, so yeah, we need accountability structures, even for libertarians, because uh, even Frodo Baggins by the end of that long journey, wasn't ready to let go of that ring of power. Yeah. You know, I introduced you as the Liberty Jedi, and you've made like four uh, Lord of the Rings references and no Star Wars <laughs> references yet. Well, I don't, I, yeah, <laughs> maybe I should throw something in there. I, I just, I guess, I'm just a Liberty nerd overall. Uh, that's my kind of people. Uh, yeah, I, I think the only way for me to put up a safeguard is just the people that I have around me. I have a, I have a lot of friends that have no fear at all in what they tell me and i don't i think that i could be the president of the united states and most of the people that i'm friends with right now would still be like david you're being an asshole stop it <laughs> like and then you say off to the gulags with you oh <laughs> uh, i i've yeah probably i don't know maybe i don't we'll know see. that's when we know that the ring of power has gotten to you too yeah much. <laughs> right when i start locking up my friends then yeah yeah then i think I think there would be plenty of them that wouldn't hesitate to assassinate me. Well, those are good Not friends good to have, I suppose. Right, yeah. Hopefully I mean, they try to talk to you first, but you know. Right. Yeah, but if that doesn't work, like, all right, he's gone tyrannical. Take him out. Yeah, as, as uh, Thomas Massey, you know, says, you know, when someone becomes a political zombie, it, you got to – just the humanitarian thing to put them out of their misery. Now, he's talking in a political sense, get them out of office, but yeah, I suppose the metaphor works both ways. There you go. I'm just joking for the NSA listeners. For the NSA listeners. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I really hope that the NSA and the FBI never watches this YouTube channel because that would be super spicy if they did that. Let's well, not. <laughs> so who's been the most uh, surprising or like interesting friend that you've made along your journey? Oh, um. 
Wow, that's an interesting question. I think of a lot of people. Um, you know, it's funny when you start off as like a young, bright-eyed liberty activist, you look up to like all of these, you know, heroes, Ron Paul, Rand Paul, uh, and this people who were on the stage near them, you know, different thinkers. And you know, the longer I've been in the liberty movement, I've kind of realized, um, you know, you meet your heroes and you realize they're just human beings like the rest of us. And, uh, and that's a healthy thing to realize too. I would say um, one of the best people I'm glad that I've become friends with, and I've actually looked to a bit as a, as a mentor over the years, uh, is uh, Jack Hunter. Do you know Jack Hunter? Mm. I just uh, met him on Clubhouse a little while back. Jack is great. Jack, I think, is one of the great communicators in the Liberty Movement. Uh, Jack was a big, played a very big role in me. Um, you know, I was a neoconservative when I was younger, um, you know, until my like senior year of college and 2010 Tea Party wave and all that started you know, watching Glenn Beck and that kind of just pulled me at just a, was a slight degree shift from being a neoconservative. And then I read Ron Paul's book, but it was Jack Hunter's like YouTube videos that just drove it home. And he was very good at communicating to conservatives. Why, if we really believe in these conservative principles of limited government, if, you know, if we believe that, you know, the Department of Health and Human Services is a, is a, is a, inefficient and corrupt government bureaucracy uh, that we shouldn't trust with our tax dollars, then where is the magical fairy dust that we sprinkle over the Pentagon that makes it anything different? And it just kind of makes, as a, that was an aha moment for me where I realized, oh, wait, we should be trying to be philosophically consistent if, if our principles actually mean anything. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and Jack, uh, you know, I, I, I learned a lot from Jack Hunter just by watching him over the years um, uh, about political communication and how to reach people where they are. But, um, but over the years, because I've been at this for like 11 years now, um, over the years, uh, as I've gotten to know Jack Hunter more and more on a personal level, um, he's just an all-around great guy um, and um, uh, someone I still look up to, but someone who I also now consider a friend. That's awesome. Yeah, I've gotten to interact with him just a little bit on the socials, whether that be Twitter or, uh, or Clubhouse. Um, I think he follows me on Twitter now. That, yeah. that was a big. I got I got like four or five people in one day because of a Clubhouse room that I hosted, like one of the first ones that I hosted with Jess Mears. I'm pretty sure you were there. Um, it was. I this was probably like a month kind ago. of became a debate with like. Partly between me and Justin Amash, but then like Jack Hunter and Matt mm -hmm. Kibbe like hopped in and there was back yep. and forth about like the LP versus the GOP and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that yeah. one. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. So uh, all most of those people you just mentioned all followed me on Twitter that either that night or the next day. And I was like, uh, yes, <laughs> I am somebody now. <laughs> yeah. And here's the truth. As you were somebody before then, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, these people are just people. I think we can put people on a pedestal too much. And they're very, they're good people. These are good people to know, good yeah. people to be friends with. But like, uh, like we can, the worst thing is when we like, you know, I used to do this even with politicians. Like I'd show up to my state house to testify on a bill when I used before I held office, testify on a bill. And I stand in front of the committee. And I'm like, oh, all these great you know, these, these demigods of the, of, from Mount Olympus, you know, here I'm before them. Who am I? I'm just this little person. And you just kind of get to know these people and especially the politicians. And you realize the politicians are just people mm -hmm. and they're not even especially good people. Right. <laughs> so anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there some, most of them are people, some of them are like lizard people or something well obviously obviously reptilians uh you yeah. know not included in the people comment but uh <laughs> yeah it it has been really fun the last uh For about a year listening in, I, i'm joking about the reptilians too yeah if someone's gonna take that and say eric brakey believes in reptilians mm -hmm. I'm i've i've had people on the show that do not gonna lie uh well you know hey 
Who knows? <laughs> right. I mean, like I, we said, I, say crazier, I would say crazier things have turned out to be true this last year, but I still think that's a little bit crazier than than uh, the stuff from this past year. But I could be wrong. Who knows? Ever so Ever. slightly. Uh, it's just like, well, it depends on whether or not it's the the rumor that or the the conspiracy that they exist or that they like control everything. Because mm. they control everything, I don't think. Um, but they exist, maybe. You know, yeah. do, do they live under the Earth core? <laughs> like you said, weirder things have turned out. To I mean, hey, true. they can't prove reptilians don't exist. I don't know whether well, you can't you can't right. prove it you can't prove a negative right so mm -hmm. uh, hey what 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 time um how, how long are we going for here oh I was actually uh, I was gonna just ask how uh, how people could could get involved in Young Americans for Liberty uh, awesome that's a great question yeah <laughs> and then kind of wrap up after that all right well. Uh, if you would like to get involved in Young Americans for Liberty, there are a couple th ways you can do that. One, we've got our big national convention coming up this August in Orlando, the 5th through the 7th. We're going to have a lot of our great activists, our Liberty legislators, some huge speakers. I heard one name that I don't know if I'm allowed to say who it is yet, who's going to be speaking there, but I'm very excited. I'll just say that he's going to have to be... Um, uh, broadcasting in from Russia, and it's not Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm excited for that person. Maybe <laughs> some can speculate and guess. Um, and um, but that convention, uh, we, we're taking applications for uh, for folks who want to come to the convention. So you can uh, apply on yaliberty.org. And while you're there, if you'd like to go to the next step, if you'd like a job making Liberty win. We are always hiring, um, you know, young liberty activists. And believe me, there was nothing like this when I was a young liberty activist. I was so fortunate to get the job with the Ron Paul campaign. And now there are so many opportunities uh, for jobs for young liberty activists, uh, both helping to elect liberty legislators in election season, but also we've expanded. We're doing programs now in legislative season where we are, we, we are hiring activists to put pressure on the politicians to um, to vote the right way on key issues. And this is how uh, we got constitutional carry to pass in the House in Texas, how we're fighting for uh, school, school choice. We fought for and succeeded on school choice in Kentucky and so many other legislative battles across the country. It's because of our activists who get paid to do activism work um, through our Hazlitt Action Program. So if you would like to come to our convention, or you would like a job making Liberty win, go to yaliberty.org and you can apply there. And you can follow me personally on Twitter at Senator Brakey. All right. I cannot stress enough to you guys how awesome it is to be able to get housed and driven around and paid to knock doors for Liberty and just get to spend your summer doing that because there really isn't a more fulfilling thing that you can do with your life that, that I've experienced thus far, uh, other than working in this industry. And, and the friendships you make, the, 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 yeah. the folks that you are like, you know, you know, uh, uh, working with, you know, on the ground every day, those are bonds that last a lifetime. Yeah. Yeah, I got to. I I got really blessed. I was in Justin Jackson's house in oh. uh, in Michigan for <laughs> about Justin seven weeks. Hello. He's he's oh, one yeah. of our newest uh, regional directors here at Young Americans for Liberty. Mm -hmm. I haven't had him on since he got the promotion, so I'll have to have him back on and tell me about his new job. I had All him right. on at Christmas, but yeah, great guy. You guys have have a lot of great people, so I will look forward to working with you guys again soon. Absolutely, David. Hey, glad to be on the program with you. Thanks for coming. Guys, thank you so much for watching. We will be back later for a 420 Smoke Sesh special with a hodgepodge of people. Uh, but until then, keep up the fight.